they got rust, falling treads, smashes, crashes. <laughs> now, all I'm doing is right now, I'm going quickly through this so that we can, you know, and we got grading, that's those spacers in the grading that does what? Keeps the bars all one inch on center screws, those blow out on the inside. What happens to your foot? Goes through it, and traps you. So it's, those are irreparable, you can't get in there. School in Jersey by the ocean. Elementary school. How much rust? Too much. Ladders. California has this <coughs> slide ladders a lot. This is called an accordion ladder. It'll, it'll expand up to 25 feet. So they usually have a lot of these hanging out over a sidewalk. When you release them, they unwind and they basically go about like an accordion. And it's a stiff lap. But when you crank it up, it keeps it all nice and tight. So these are all typical ladders that you've seen. Now, can ladders end seven to eight feet off the ground? They must be complete to the ground. So what happens when I find one that's incomplete? What's the violation? It's incomplete. So it must be complete to the ground. So another ladder next to it to make it a guillotine and drop the rest of it down to the ground. That ladder can be made into a fold out so that half of it folds out and makes an 18 inch wide ladder. You can also make it so that it's a balanced ladder with cables. Goosenecks over the, over the roof. So man, this is a fireman, but it needs to be inspected. Some people have taken ladders and they've actually cut them in half and folded it back into itself. You do that, that legal? Can I let a ladder swing out and when it comes down to pile drives anybody on the other side? Mm -hmm. so I can slide it, but I can't make it loop out and hit somebody because uh, wind or anything can make that basically go up, hit a child, hit a fireman in the head. So people have modified ladders. Okay? Cantilevers. This is a cantilever in Chicago. But for the sake of speed, I'm gonna we talked about what to what needs to be done when you're basically dealing with the fire escape. You got to start a program. It's three to five years. That's going to take. This is some of the classes we've done down in Washington D.C. and various places. We talked about that the three codes basically already got you back. You didn't know that the three codes. So if somebody's attacking the the fire, if somebody's attacking the building department, who's going to come to their rescue? They demands the same low test. Fire. If firemen to get are getting blasted. The building department can show up. NFPA, what about OSHA? OSHA says you can. So we've got all these, all these confidence tests that exist nationwide. Do you have a confidence test here? If you, don't, if you want to copy one, copy Seattle, copy Tacoma, copy Portland, copy uh, you know, uh, Newark. It's not, it's not that anybody has one. It was never one ever, and there isn't a standard. The only one right now that you can say it sits on some book somewhere, right now is Portland, Oregon, on that checklist. So it, it's a matter of, not that you need to change the code. The code is pretty clear. All the authority having jurisdiction shall accept by low test or other evidence of strength. Do we need to clarify that anymore? We can you do departmental procedures and guidelines to clarify what that means. This is the Boston one to the best of my information knowledge and belief. Cities outside of Boston are incorporating these tag, I mean the, the, the confidence test. Is Boston incorporating the confidence test? Not yet. So why is that? Why is sometimes the major cities the last to, to do it? Politics and money. Politics and money sometimes, that's exactly what it is. So here's the tag, here's the confidence test. You can get it right off the internet. We talked about the yearly inspection, which is going to be really important. We talked about Oregon. Let me show you some. Uh, and then, again, if somebody says, well, it's not a state document, well, then Oregon has a state document now. The tax. This helps everybody. This helps the tenants know that the building is safe. This helps the firemen do whatever they have to do. And this lets the building inspectors walking around say what? That you're out of compliance. 
same way you say that your elevator is out of compliance, the tag is out. This is our code, 1001.3, all exterior steel wooden stairs. Okay, we mentioned fire escape yet? When you look at your code, you're gonna find that even though we're having a fire escape class here, you know what the code really belongs to? When you read the, the code in its entirety, does anybody here have the code, the building code? Do you have it? Can you check, uh, it's the, can you check 1000, uh, see if you're 1001.3? Uh, no, no, no. Are you this IBC or ICC? IBC. Yeah, check it. Check 1001.3. Where is the fire code? Oh, it says to go back to the fire code? Yeah. So it used to be in there, and basically what I was trying to make is a point here is that all exterior bridges. Have we talked about fire escapes yet? Steel or wooden stairs. Have we talked about fire escapes yet? So all those porches on the back of a building, all those decks. Remember how many people died in Chicago on the deck failure? Isn't this the code that covered it? All exterior bridges, steel or wooden stairways, fire escapes, egress balconies shall be examined. So the code, we're talking about the tip of the iceberg here, guys, just fire escapes. You know what's below that? All exterior steel or wooden stairs is covered by this code, which references back to the fire code. So with that being said, is this a steel wooden stair or, or, or a fire escape? We don't know. Steel wooden stair or fire escapes? Steel wooden stairs, balconies, Romeo and Juliet balconies, do these need to be examined? Under the code? Hotels, those exterior walkways in hotels, motels, they need to be examined? Rare porches, rare hangouts, or we call these bike collectors or um, uh, Coke can uh, depositories? Barbecue uh, storage facilities? So these need to be examined? As per, as per the code, all exterior steel wooden stairs. Do these need to be examined? Do these need to be examined? Is it exterior steel or wooden? Does it need to be examined and certified? So this is the tip of the iceberg, right guys? Rusty is the tip of the iceberg. Where are you going to start? Are you going to start with the iceberg or the tip? Start with the tip because the rest will come. Let's start with the tip. This is the this will have the most impact. This is the biggest. People are at least positive. Oh what? Uh, right. Are you asking? Is it okay? But yeah. The all fire escapes must match the building type. So can I have a wooden fire escape? If I have to match the building type? Right enough. Get it. But if I have a if I have a fire escape or. And in its exterior, do I need to, and I need to examine it? Can I have it? Can I have a wood fire escape as well as a steel one? If I match the building type, and can it be five quarter wood? Or does it have to be inch and a half? Must be fire rated, inch and a half. Some decks that get built, some fire escapes that get built, they get built to deck code or fire escape code. Deck code. So we catch a lot of those that somebody built a deck that also became, a, that is also part of the e e egress, and we can't load it to 100 pounds, so they have to beef it up. And a lot of times it's double amp to five quarter. And whether or not the, the, the decking that you're talking about is fire rated, that's a question for the fire, fire department. But either way, it has to be an inch and a half of the same material. These need to be examined. These, uh, these handicap ramps, do these need to be examined? and fertilizer tanks and, and industri industrial locations that have spirals along the outside. Those need to be examined? Not by, you don't have jurisdiction or state. Any agriculture or type buildings, you don't have jurisdiction. So they're just free, free ride? No. 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 Agriculture. 
industrial. 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 It's all industrial. Going up the tanks, climbing up the side of factories. Yeah, it's actually average. Yeah, it's not 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 average. Yeah, it's not
was to get into this building and basically slide down this fire escape. So the, the, one of the guys that uh, was a fireman there said his grandfather used to run the run the maintenance bar to stop the kids from doing it because they're all white press shirt. He used to throw coal dust down the uh, down the chute and then just wait to see who was uh, the culprit. So that's what he did. So the only slide escape. But look, slide escape used to be a standard on a lot of buildings. They got rid of all because you used to be able to just jump out and slide down. Primarily, a lot of military facilities used to have slide scapes. <coughs> Nobody does them anymore. It's illegal because it's a one-way system. You can't go back up. These are augment. This is a, this is additional above and beyond. You got got these rope ladders that sometimes you guys have out of us. This is not an improved means of egress. It's an augmented. Right, but you can. You can buy these online for 75 bucks to 275 bucks. You keep them in a bag, you keep them by your closet. When they're in case of the fire, you throw it out your window and you go down. But it's not an approved means of egress. But you can have them, but it's not an approved means of egress. Got it? They also have these ladders that you buy from Jumbi. And basically, you go out. You see this person out the window? And it looks like a drain pipe when you close it and you hit it and it opens up and then you climb down. It's not an approved means of egress. So some homeowners are buying these things and putting it on their second to third floors on average and calling that the means of egress and it's not. So whenever you find these stuff, it can be a third means of egress. They can never be your second means of egress. So you can have as many of these as you want, but as long as they don't make up your second means of egress. Okay? So whenever you see these bags and fold-outs are not. Now, I can have a fold-out that's part of a, of, of a system that had a platform and they had a fixed slider and they moved it to a fold out, yes, because they had a pre existing condition with, with a fire escape. Got it? And so, as you can see, spirals do come into play, full staircases to the ground. Now, here's a advanced version of what's coming in some of your high rises. Now, most of the fire escape systems out there are the traditional fire escapes, but there is a third means of egress. And uh, that is in two types. One is a self-evacuation suit, and the second is a, uh, a, a you know, two-story building evacuation suit. So if you live in a high-rise building, you probably at least wondered how you would get out of there if there was a fire. Those fears became all too real for thousands of Americans on September 11th. Many were trapped in the World Trade Center towers as the floors below them burned. Well, now inventors are working on new technology to help people get out alive. Our author has a look at one invention. Right, and down he goes. Looks simple, and it is. The Recover All High Rise Evacuation System being tested on this day by firefighters. <laughs> <laughs> we have a 50 story. Get inside, bring your kid inside, your dog inside with you. Get out of the window, smash it up, jump out. To be used by it can be a two-way system, so as it goes up and down, it basically goes up. In some cases, where the fire can't get you out all the way down, they got to go to the roof. Which eliminates the fear of heights. The first step for evacuation is putting on the big suit. Yeah, it's Yeah, it's like a 
right into the building. And then put people out of the building using the same thing, so.
What's he going to do for you? He's going to ask for a copy of the certificate during whatever inspections he does. Because if he doesn't get a copy of, the, of those inspections, what's he give you again? Referral. That, that makes you do what? Inspect. Because he can't enforce. The enforcement is on your end, so he's just saying, I asked. I'm supposed to staple two papers together from now on when I do my thing. It, this one is an incomplete one, so he still does his job, still completes, but you're making, that's a checklist item. So that helps you guys do that. Then we start talking about confidence tests, tags. This class is one that's, once you start writing violations, what's going to come the next six months to a year is actually another class with engineers and, and contractors in the class. To teach them what? How to do it correct, how to inspect correctly, and how to prepare correctly because <coughs> it's, and submit the proper paperwork because you guys, every fire escape you get is going to be a guinea pig. You know what I'm saying? And who's going to handle it for you? Who handles all issues? It's Al. Just give it all to Al and let Al run it. And Al, Al will basically take and get the support or not support, but uh, Al and his counterpart in fire prevention they basically are going to take the, the long walk down, the, down this because it's going to open up a few cans of worms. And that's, there's going to be some political blowback. But whenever they attack, they have to attack three codes. They can attack the building department because it's a code issue. But when they attack the fire department, what is it? It's a life safety. What, what do firemen, I mean, what do politicians hate to touch? Life safety. When you mention babies and dying firemen, what happens? So, as you play, as you as you're delicately dancing that delicate dance, say, "Hey, you know, it's not really me. I'm going to be fine with this letter that I'm getting from this engineer. It's really the fire department that is ordering the load test." Can that ever happen? But, but if I may. In the code it says that you guys are dealing with the, with the inspection, but then it says, see the fire code. So this, huh? right, right. So it's back to the fire code saying, oh, a load test. So now you're, you're interpreting two codes, am I correct? Yes. So I'm just hoping, I don't have an answer here. I'm just telling you guys what's coming as far as, and that's why this is going to take three to five years. This is not going to happen overnight. But if you are interested in it, and you can go online and type in fire escape inspection, fire escape repair, fire escape uh, seminars, and you're going to basically see downtown walk around and what to look for. And if only one of you out of here basically starts writing a violation, how's that going to differ from the last year here? If one of you is write a violation? The 100%? Yeah. Uh, no, it's going to start. Will it finish? No, it's just the beginning. Once we get this as a, as, a, as a point where you guys are just moving along, but make it natural triggers. We also talked about the, uh, one of the last pieces that I want to leave, and I want to see if you have any questions, is OSHA. How does OSHA, even though it's not an enforcement entity, what is OSHA doing to anybody that's an employee of any company, institution, and uh, uh, city, municipal, what is OSHA saying that that person is required to have if they're going to occupy any building? So when you're doing construction and repair, what is the first thing they're supposed to be focused on before they start working on that building for a year? And if it's a $100,000 problem on that big monster 10 story, what do you tell them? What's the, what's the alternative? Temporary scaffolding, they keep on going. How about temporary repairs? Okay. So let's open it up. Let's open up to some questions. If you guys have uh, any questions, we got about five minutes left. If you want to be out here by uh, three thirty, does anybody have any questions? Agree, disagree. <laughs> Looks like I got the buzzword going. Right? I think they're speechy. Like, I think they got. I think they got hit hard. All right. I went downstairs and I talked to Ralph, uh, the director of corrective right, operations. Not out. Not out. <laughs> so, we do have an L. Um, part of it is correct in his approach that under the facade ordinance, if there is an unsafe condition, the majority of it, all well, that work goes to contract the service. So, um, you know, but if you know, if you were right, 
Good. That's correct. Right. So they, they're not going to tie it in to the facade. Unless they're on a facade. And, well, or actually, but the thing is, is it doesn't fit in that So even though it's not spelled out what the impertinence is, whether it's a Juliet balcony, whether it's a fire escape, you know, whether it may be, and I can think of one, it's 1218 Arch Street, which is a start the building in the AIA building. I actually, as a plan review, I did ask for certification of the system. I wanted an engineer's report on the, on the integrity of it, and guess what? The, per, the permit got pulled. And then they did they, they did come back and they did submit and I walked down there not too long ago and understand before whether they had a permit or not, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so with that being said, uh, some of the things we're going to take away from uh, this very intensive uh, presentation is that you know we're all working uh, towards our accreditation for IAS. And um, I said to uh, Jerry James about the fact that for the development side, That's we should maybe have some kind of work instruction based on how to approach this, whether it's the required means, second means of egress. What's the, what's the occupancy? How do we deal with these uh, fire escapes? Uh, and also, we reported back to the route and see about the IAS report uh, work instruction for that. Uh, yes, sir. At the very least, you can attack this from property maintenance. No, 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 no. That's right. And, and with that being said, right at PM 307, that whole series, it's in there. It's like right here. It's in there. Right? So, you know, you have that power as property maintenance, CNI inspector, what's the title now? Code enforcement inspector to be able to rate those types of violations. So it's there. I think this something that we're, we do, something that we're, was there. This is just to bring it, bring it right. And like again, like I said, bring some best practices of what happens in other jurisdictions, you know, and uh, and see if we can incorporate them into ours. Can I ask? Can I just add one thing. You keep mentioning you can write a violation. If you have, what we said here is not that you have to write a violation. You're asking for a certificate. So no matter what you're dealing with on the building, even if it's facade. You're not looking for a violation on the that's how we That's how we notify you our, our No, I understand. Okay, but by asking for a certificate that I don't have one, does that generate a violation? Uh, it, no, it, it would be, it would be obligated to respond. We visit this also. We would be obligated to respond. Okay. We would be obligated to respond. Okay. We would be obligated to write the violation okay. and then let them respond okay. with whatever okay. identification they have. Okay. And then if they do that in 30 days, sorry. Mm -hmm. It's the compliance end of it. It's the, 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 what we're looking for. We break the violations. It, it could be a track roll. It could be our development skills, and it could be our code enforcement code. We write the violation. How we get to actually apply that violation is another story, and that's the process of our procedural what we have to do to work on. We write the violation. Clients get the certification. That's where we're lacking, so to speak, and that's what we have to work on. on how we get the compliance? Not just the, the form, like you want to show the drawer from an engineer saying, "Oh, we painted it. It's okay." We want to get something in the procedure that says, "This is how you get the compliance." That's what we have to work on. Sometimes it's hard for you to go out and see structural problems. And again, square head bolts, rivets, and the cave wire that it has or has not been maintained. Structural problems. Has or has not been maintained. Has not been maintained. Right. But the easiest one, you can walk down any fire escape, look out, and if you see surface rust on a fire escape, what's the violation? It's a maintenance. So you don't have to find structural. You can walk up to any building. You don't have to see dangling treads. You don't have to worry about square head bolts and rivets. You look up and it's not painted. You have a maintenance violation and you can continue on your business. Don't look for trouble. There's two troubles that you find that automatically trigger a violation. The easiest one all day long that comes to your face, in your face every day is if it's brown, it's already in violation. If it's brown, that means all the, all the connections have been violated by rust. If it's brown, it means that the fire escape uh, connections are suspect. We will verify that they're not suspect for you. The engineer. So, and you look up, it's 
brown, that's all you need. Don't look for dangling, don't look for bolts, don't look for ribbons. So use the maintenance work. You know that the property makes it so much cooler. So there's 307. On the 307, you write a property maintenance that needs to be painted. Not just painted, but cool, just painted. I need to be now painted and tested. So that's all you write on your violations. You can write, write on the violations too. I need your fire escape um, painted and tested. We need to pay some compliance to what we're looking at. Our pay for compliance has to be straightened out as far as